There's no greater gift than the friendship of the Holy Spirit. We're in a series right now we're calling The Intimate Pursuit. And our goal during this series is really how to cultivate a friendship with God. The story throughout the history of the Bible and the history of mankind is a story of God pursuing us for relationship with him. It goes all the way back to the garden where Adam walked with God in the cool of the noonday. And so God sent his only son so that we could have this access to the Lord and this friendship with him through the Holy Spirit. How many are you thankful for what God did by sending his only son for us? Then the Holy Spirit came to lead and to guide us and to be this mediator between us and the Father. And now we have access to this friendship with the Lord. And I pray that during this series you've begun to develop this friendship, this intimate pursuit after the Lord. And this morning what I want to talk about is how this intimate pursuit for the Lord leads to this kingdom authority that he has called us to establish here on the earth. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Isaiah. Go ahead and turn to Isaiah. We're going to be Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22. I'm hoping this morning we have some time at the end just to pursue him a little bit longer. Isaiah 22 verse 20. I'll give you a moment to get there. Isaiah 22 verse 20. It says this, Then it will come about on that day that I will summon my servant Eliakim and I will clothe him with your tunic and tie your sash securely around him and I will hand your authority over to him and he will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah Then I will put the key of the house Of David. Now I want you to remember that phrase this morning, the key of the house of David. Remember this, keys represent authority. Then I'll put the key of the house of David on his shoulders. When he opens, no one will shut, and when he shuts, no one will open. I will drive him like a peg in a firm place, and he will become a throne of glory to his father's house. I've entitled my message this morning, The Key of David. If you like my notes, you can text notes to the numbers on the screen and receive my notes this morning. Let's pray today. God, we thank you for your word, that it is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. God, we ask you today that you would take your Logos word, your written word, and make it alive in us, Jesus. Make it rhema in our hearts, oh God. That, Lord, you would speak to every, every single individual that is in this room this morning, Jesus. That, Lord, we would learn how to walk in kingdom authority that you have called us to walk in. Is what you have mandated us to do as children of God. But, Lord, more than anything else, God, may you be lifted up and may you be seen. No man, no person. Lord, this is your house, the house of your presence, God. Lord, we don't want to steal any amount of glory from you. So Jesus, help us to go low today. Help us to go low today. Lord, I come humbly today, Jesus. Humble me, Lord. We love you. We thank you, Jesus. Everyone said in this place this morning, come on, someone, amen, amen. Thank you, Wesley. Appreciate it. How many of you in this room, you prefer a cat over a dog? I'm going somewhere with this. You're a cat person. A couple of you people in this room, I, I don't mean an offense to this. Hopefully you don't take it. I unfortunately have a cat. <laughs> 
And the reason why I say unfortunately is because this cat made it meows in the morning, and it wakes me up when it's about 4.30 a.m., and I try to find it at nighttime, try to lock it away into its room, but still somehow it feels like this cat, before the night gets out, like she's hiding someplace, can't find her, and then she wakes me up in the morning. That's why I say unfortunately. But we bought this cat about eight years ago. And uh, so I took my kids to a, a pet store, and beautiful, beautiful cat. My daughter picked her out. I said, okay, we're going we're gonna to buy this cat for our family. And so at the time, Ruth now is 13 years old. And by the way, she's on the El Salvador trip. Be praying for, for everyone on that missions trip in Salvador. They actually landed safely yesterday. And so uh, they're excited about the ministry they're going to be doing uh, there uh, this week. There's about 18 of them. Uh, so, but I had my, my daughter uh, name the cat. She was into to Frozen. Remember Frozen back in the day? And so the cat's name uh, was, is, is Princess Anna. Princess Anna, because she was into Frozen. And I bought this cat for our house, but I gave her the authority to name this cat. Okay? This is where I'm going with this. The greatest privilege that we have... The greatest honor that we have as children of God is that God has called us to establish his kingdom here on the earth. He has called us to establish his kingdom, what is in heaven, here on the earth. It is our mandate. It is our calling. It is why we are here. Not only are we here for this relationship, this intimate friendship with God, but this intimate friendship should lead us to establishing his kingdom here on the earth. Jesus says this to Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys. Everybody say keys this morning. I will give you the keys. Keys represent authority. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, it is unbiblical and not scriptural, though, to think that heaven is subject to earth. Earth is always subject to heaven. Earth is always subject to heaven. So that's why we pray the will of God in our lives. That's why Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words, say my words, my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My question this morning, though, is is how can the words of God be within us if we don't have this intimate pursuit and friendship with the Lord. Because this is not a name it, claim it gospel. This is not a prosperity gospel. This is not whatever we want. We're declaring and we get it. No, it's declaring the will of God. But how are we going to understand and know the will of God if we are not with the one who has a will? (laughs) If we don't have this intimate pursuit for God, we don't understand or even know what his will is. Intimate pursuit leads to authority. Authority does not lead to intimate pursuit, right? Our intimate pursuit with God leads to us walking in this authority. It's not backwards. Authority does not lead to this friendship with the Lord. Sometimes I think that somehow we've got this backwards, yeah? So when you study the life of David, you you quickly realize that David, he walked in authority But he also had this hunger and this desire and this intimate pursuit for the Lord. The foundation for David's authority was a desire for friendship with God more than anything else. Yeah? The key of David unlocks intimacy in prayer first. And it is intimacy in prayer that unlocks our authority our kingdom authority. So the goal here this morning for us is not for us to walk in authority. The goal here this morning for us is to learn the key to unlock this kingdom authority in which God has called every believer to walk in. Amen? That is the goal. This intimate pursuit after God, which then leads to unlocking kingdom authority. This is why it's called the key of David. David was given authority because his intimate pursuit after God. God wants us to walk in authority that he has given us. 
He has given us the keys, amen? Keys represent authority. So what I want to do this morning is I want to give you three keys this morning, three keys to unlocking kingdom authority. Three keys to unlocking kingdom authority. How many of you want to walk in a greater measure of kingdom authority in this room? Anyone at all? The first key to unlocking kingdom authority is this. Heart. Heart is a key to unlocking kingdom authority. A heart after God. A heart after God. Listen, before there was a key of David, there was a heart of David. Before there was a key of David, there was a heart of David. Before David had authority as king, he had a heart after God. Before David's name was even mentioned, his heart was mentioned. His heart was mentioned in 1 Samuel chapter 13. His name wasn't mentioned until 1 Samuel chapter 16. Let me show you this. 1 Samuel chapter 13, it says this. Verse 14, this is Samuel speaking to Saul. But now your kingdom shall not endure. Again, this is Samuel speaking to Saul. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him, him being David. He has appointed him ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So in contrast here, Saul was a man after Israel's heart. He was a man after man's heart. Saul looked the part. He had a, a level of prestige. He had a level of what looked on the outside as earthly authority. But David, he had a heart after God. So God went and searched the world, and he didn't search the world for what seemed on the outside as what would seem like a good king. He didn't search the world for a man who had prestige. He didn't search the world for a man who had stature. He didn't search the world for a man who looked the part. What did he search the world for? He searched the world for a heart, a heart after him. And so we found David, a man with a broken and a contrite heart. But he knew within this man who had a broken and contrite heart was a king. It's from this heart place, this heart position of hunger for the Lord that he found David. Before David's name was ever mentioned, his heart was mentioned. Look now in 1 Samuel chapter 16, and right here in 1 Samuel chapter 16, you see David's name mentioned first. So Samuel is coming to anoint a king. He's coming to anoint the next king to follow Saul. And so he goes, shows up at Jesse's house, and he's going to anoint one of his sons. Jesse lines up all of his sons except for David. David is left in the field attending the sheep. Because there's no way it's going to be David. He's the youngest. He doesn't look the part. Jesse's thinking, no way it's my youngest son. It's got to be Eliab. And that's actually what Samuel thought as well at first. And so God speaks to Samuel, and he says this. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. Talking about Eliab. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. Samuel was looking for someone to be king and could walk in kingly authority. He was looking for someone that looked the part. But the key that God has entrusted us with, the key of David, was never intended to unlock more authority. Its intention is to unlock a greater spiritual pursuit within us that will then bring the fruit of greater spiritual authority for the sake of the assignment and the destiny that is on our lives personally and corporately. He's looking for a heart after him. Not a heart to please those around him, not a heart to, to, to make ourselves look good, but a heart that is only after God. You see, our, our standard here at Journey is this. I'm not here to, to please anyone. What I am here to do is I am here, and what I would really try to do and check my heart, man, I want to please God first, yeah? I want to please God first. Our, our heart and our desire is to please him first. 
Not to please man, not to make ourselves look good, but what is it? It's to please God first. And this is a really difficult thing as you kind of navigate this in within your own heart. Because none of us are perfect, and pride is one of the things that, man, it is the biggest trap that every person, I believe, it does struggle with to a certain level and degree. And that's why you got to say, Lord, Lord, would you search my heart? God, would you know my heart? God, show me, Lord, where I am wrong. Because I've, I've walked in even my own time in my own seasons where I've struggled with pride and didn't even recognize it in my own life. But Lord, would you check my heart, God? Would you know my heart, God? And would you cleanse me? Would you show me those areas in which, God, I am not fully surrendered over to you? Because God, he looks at the heart. In order to walk in kingdom authority, first thing, you've got to have a heart a heart that is broken and contrite, a humble heart, a heart after God. The second key to unlocking kingdom authority is passion. Passion. Passion is a key to unlocking kingdom authority. Everybody say passion. It's your passion for God. You see, the level and degree of our passion for God must increase in order to sustain the weight of the calling that is on our lives. There's another level of spiritual burning. There's another level of passion that I believe that the Lord is calling us to individually and corporately here at Journey in order to sustain what God is calling us into in the purpose and destiny that is on our lives. If we don't have this passion To intimately pursue the Lord, everything quickly becomes a chase after earthly success. You follow me this morning? If we don't have this passion for God, it really quickly becomes this chase after earthly success in our lives. And who cares about earthly success? What we want is kingdom success. We want to establish his kingdom, not our own kingdom, here on this earth. Maybe for some of us in this room right now, we're like, man, Adam, I am lukewarm. I've been struggling. I've been battling. And it just feels like, you know, my passion for the Lord has faded away. My passion for the Lord is almost to that point where I just feel like I'm going through the motions constantly. I've been there before, church. I have been there before. And what I've learned is what gets me out of that place is to develop this discipline of being with the Lord every single time that I wake up, and that discipline quickly becomes into a place where I just crave to be with Jesus. It starts with a discipline, and it leads you to a place of just hunger for the Lord. We've said this around here, that you're, you're, the more you hunger for the Lord, the hungrier you are for him. I'm reminded of Paul as he tells Timothy to fan into flame a passion for the name of Jesus. And I just want to challenge you, man. If you are in this place and you're feeling lukewarm, man, stir that passion up again for the call of God upon your life. What is happening right now in society today, we cannot be lukewarm Christians in order to make it. It is impossible. And my challenge to you today is stir that fire. Catch the fire of God that he wants to give you in place on your life. May he baptize you in this Holy Ghost fire that burns and catches on to everybody else around you. You see, when you burn for Jesus, what happens is everybody else uh, sees it, understands it, spreads like wildfire. And what I believe and what I know is there's a different level that God wants to take our passion to for him. We're not here just to play church, are we? We're here to establish the kingdom of God, but the only way in which we're going to establish the kingdom of God is to have a passion for him. It's to have a passion for him that sustains us. <laughs> Psalm 51, it says this, verse 16, for the source of your pleasure is not in my performance, this is David saying this, or the sacrifices. It's not in my performance. <laughs> Isn't that good to know that it's not in our performance? I'm not here to perform for the Lord. I'm here to rest and just be used by him. Oh, God, Lord, whatever you want to say to me, Lord, that's what I want to go do. Lord, whatever you want to speak to me, I want to have the boldness to go do it. Lord, would you help me to do that, Father? Like it's just hearing his voice because you've been with this secret place and you know what it's like to fellowship with the Lord and then you just walk out in the boldness to go do it. For the source of your pleasure is not in my performance. We try to perform so often in church today. We're not here to perform. 
or the sacrifices, sacrifices meeting our worship. I mean, we're just, if we just offer lip service, but our heart is far from God, he doesn't even receive our worship. The fountain of your pleasure is found in the sacrifice of my shattered heart before you. You will not despise my tenderness. David had this broken, contrite heart, a heart humble and not proud. The last thing on David's mind was promotion because all he thought about was this pursuit after the Lord. From that pursuit came this kingly anointing and authority that he walked in. David's authority was not from his lineage. David's authority was not from his performance of how good he was, but his passion and intimate pursuit for the Lord. Listen, church, I want to just say this, and hopefully you receive this this morning. I'm, I'm not trying to negate by any means the spiritual authority that we have as believers, But the foundation of our God-given authority is not intimacy and relationship, then it really is not spiritual authority at all. What it is, is it's just a bunch of emotional, religious rhetoric that God does not respond to. What ends up happening is we just pray loudly and we dance before the Lord without actually having a relationship with Him in private. And he's not answering because you're acting the part in public without the passion for him in private. I'm not looking to be a church that is just a charismatic zoo where all we're chasing after is a bunch of Holy Ghost goosebumps because if our face hits the floor and we walk out the door unchanged, you're here for entertainment and you're not here for the gospel which Jesus died for. You've got an appearance of authority, but you carry no authority. And the powers of hell don't know you because you're no threat. Because they know you're not pursuing God for this real relationship for him. And so all the powers of darkness respond to you. Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Just as they did to the sons of Sceva in Acts chapter 16, where they said to the sons of Sceva, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who the heck are you? You carry no authority. You have the appearance of authority, but you don't walk in authority because you don't actually have a relationship with the Lord. And I am also guilty of this at times. May our hunger and may our pursuit and may our passion be Jesus and be his presence and be this friendship with the Lord so then we can walk in the spiritual authority that God has called us to establish in his kingdom here on the earth. The enemy will not respond to your appearance of authority or religion or your fancy words, but the enemy must respond to ones whose passion and intimate pursuit after the Lord. Do you want to make hell tremble? Be like David. God, this one thing I desire and this alone I seek that I'll dwell in the house of the Lord. If you want to make hell tremble, man, be like David. Lord, I hunger and thirst for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. If you want to make hell tremble, be like David. Where David said, Lord, your face, God, I will seek. If you want to make hell tremble, be like David as the deer pants for your water water, God, so my soul, it pants after you. This is the passion and this is the fire that was in David which caused him to have the key of David, to walk in this authority in which he walked in. I believe God wants us to cross over into a new level of passion and anointing that only is found in the secret place. I'm calling us. This is why we're in this series. This is why we've kind of given you some some basic steps in how to steward your time with the Lord. We talked about how it's in week one of how it it starts off with many believers as understanding, okay, I have come to a place of brokenness where my only last resort is to go to the Lord. But what we want to get to is that in every season we go to the Lord. Then we talked about in week two how how to steward that time in the secret place that as you wake up in the morning, this is how you 
come before the Lord. This is your heart posture. This is how you approach the word of God. That is, you're not sitting there to read a Bible reading plan. You're sitting there and you're reading to encounter the living God. And that as you encounter the living God through his word, because it's his word, that's how you hear the voice of God. That's the most common way you hear the voice of God. And as you read his word, what ends up happening is you want to stop as he convicts your heart, as he shows you things, and you study it. You're reading for encounter, not a Bible reading plan. Last week we talked about the different ways in which we encounter God. Pastor Mike took us through that. Because I believe we're all made up differently. We all encounter God the same. But there's also we encounter God differently in a level that maybe some things are stronger in our life. For me, like adoration is, is my number one way I encounter God. Adoration being just worship. Uh, established early on in my, in my life because I was a worship pastor for, for about 20 years. But this is what, where we're at. It's to stir this passion for the Lord. Because I think that what we've tried to do is we try to walk in this kingdom authority without actually having a relationship with the Lord. How can we walk in kingdom authority if we don't know the will of God because we haven't been with him? If you abide in me, my words abide in you, right? So the first way... You unlock kingdom authority. The first key is heart. The second key is passion. And the third key, the third key this morning I want to give you is trustworthiness. Trustworthiness. Trustworthiness is a key to unlocking kingdom authority. Can God trust you with the authority in which he's given you? Can God trust you? Or do you care and do we care more about impressing people? Are you easily offended because your satisfaction is in the approval of man and not of God? If that's you, if that is us, then God may not be able to trust us with what he wants to establish here on the earth and through us. And what he's called us to personally. Can God really trust you not to make it about yourself? If he allows you to carry a certain level of kingdom authority, can he trust you with it? Isaiah 22. Back to this passage that we opened up with. We're going to start in verse 15. This is what the Lord, God of armies, says. Come, go to the steward to Shebna, who is in charge of the royal household. Verse 16, what right do you have here? And whom do you have here? That you have cut out a tomb for yourself here. You who cut out a tomb on the height, you who carve a resting place for yourself in the rock. At this point, Shebna, he has authority as steward of the king. He is in charge of the royal household, and the Assyrians, they come and they breach the walls, but instead of going after God and seeking his face, what he does, he tries to build a memorial for himself, to people, for people to remember him, a grave for himself, for people to remember his legacy so he can die there. Because he cares more about what people think than going after the Lord. Shemna's authority lacked the foundation of an intimate pursuit after God, so instead he chose the appearance of authority. Look what happens when you put on a religious front and you care more about impressing people than intimately pursuing the Lord. Verse 17, behold, the Lord is about to hurl you violently, you strong man, and he's about to grasp you firmly and wrap you up tightly like a ball to be driven into a vast country. There you will die. Shemna had plans to die in a way to honor himself instead of seeking the Lord, so the Lord decided otherwise. Reading on, and there your splendid chariots will be, your shame of your master's house. I will dispose you from your office, and I will pull you down from your position. The Lord is saying right here that he will find a man that does not think that he's too good to pursue the Lord. He's saying here he will not, he's looking for a man who thinks that he's not too good and too proud to pursue God. He's looking for a man, for a woman after the heart of God. 
So God found a man, and his name is Eliakim. So do you know what the Lord called Eliakim? He called Eliakim his servant. His servant. Verse 20, then it will come about on that day that I will summon my servant Eliakim, and I will clothe him with your tunic. Shebna's tunic. Clothe in Eliakim. And I tie your sash securely around him. And I will hand your authority over to him. And he will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Then I will put the key of the house of David on his shoulders. When he opens, no one will shut. And when he shuts, no one will open. Eliakim was godly. Eliakim, he was faithful. Eliakim had not forgotten where his help had come from. Eliakim... He remembered that the Lord did not take pleasure in performance, but in the pursuit after God. Because of that, Eliakim was given Shedna's robe. Because of that, he was given his position of power and his authority. And whatever door he opened, no man can shut. Whatever door he shut, no man can open. He did not forsake seeking the Lord. And that intimacy was key that would unlock the authority. Look at this, verse 23 now. I will drive him like a peg in a firm place, and he will become a throne of glory to his father's house. A peg in a firm place means that the king could trust his steward because he was a trustworthy servant. He was a trustworthy servant. Let me ask you a question this morning, Journey. Can the Lord trust you? Can the Lord trust you? Can the Lord trust us as a church to carry his presence? Can the Lord trust us as a a church to steward what God has given us? Can the Lord trust us to steward his presence? To not take credit for ourselves. Can the Lord trust us to steward his presence where we don't, if revival hit to a different level and degree, and I believe every great revival, man, it leads to many, many people coming to know Jesus. If that were to happen for us in this, in this house, which I believe is our calling and our mandate for this region is to be a house of his presence, would we make it about ourselves and would we prostitute his presence for our own gain? My prayers, God, help our hearts and may it not be. Because the quickest way I've seen revival as I study revival and revival culture is when the God pours out his spirit, as many times people will try to make it about them and try to see how they can make money or see how they can create gain for themselves. But God can God trust us corporately, but can God also trust you individually? He's called you personally to a great destiny. Can he trust you to walk that out? Are you trustworthy? In Revelation 3, I want to invite the band to the stage. In Revelation 3, Jesus introduces himself as the one who has the key. Verse 7, it says this, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, he who is holy, he who is true, who has the key of David. Say the key of David. The key of David. The key of David represents authority. Who opens, no one will shut. And who shuts, and no one opens, says this. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no man can shut, because you have little power, and have followed my word, and have not denied my name. Now skip down to verse 11. I'm coming quickly. Hold firmly to what you have. How many believe that the Lord is coming quickly? He is coming quickly. It is not a time for us to mess around. He is coming quickly so that no one will take your crown. The crown represents here victory, and it also represents authority. God has given us authority and he wants us to walk in victory, but the only way it's going to happen is if we are a people who can counter God in the secret place and have an intimate pursuit after him. 
The one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God. Listen, this open door in the scripture is an invitation into the fullness of the presence of God and an invitation to walk out the fullness of his kingdom. It's an invitation to us to the church that he can trust, to the church that has not denied his name, to the church who has not forgotten to seek his face. This morning, there's an open invitation to seek him, leading to the establishment of his kingdom here on the earth through the authority that he has given us. I read this in the commentary this past week. I want to read this to you. It says this in this commentary. It said, A man after God's heart enthrones God as king. For Saul, Saul was king. For David, the Lord God was king. Both David and Saul knew sacrifice before battle was important. Saul knew sacrifice before battle was important. Remember that. But David thought it was important because it pleased and honored God. Saul thought it was important because it might help him win the battle. Saul thought God would help him achieve his goal. David thought that God was the goal. Is the goal victory or is the goal developing relationship in in intimate pursuit after the Lord? What is your goal? I think that we've gotten it backwards far too often where our goal has been victory in the battle instead of a relationship with God. What he is calling this house to is a different level of intimate pursuit after him. He is calling you individually. He is calling us corporately. And it is time to raise up a standard to stop being content with where we are at, to stop struggling through life. Because in this life, we will have trouble. But the most amazing thing about it is we can overcome. But it only comes from a place of being with Jesus, of having this relationship with the Lord. Far too often I've walked around seeing so many Christians in this Eeyore attitude where everything is hard and everything is difficult. And man, life is hard and life is difficult. But man, you can have joy in the battle because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And when you really come to a place of understanding what this intimate pursuit is all about as you develop this relationship with the Lord, man, life, it just seems like a different level. But what I'm calling this house to this morning is may we pursue the Lord with everything and in this pursuit establish His kingdom. Stop establishing His kingdom without a personal, intimate pursuit after Him. And so if you, want to, if you want to go after God with all that you have, you want this fire for the Lord, you want a heart after God that is humble, if that is you, would you stand at your feet right now? And let's just respond all over this room. God, our hunger and our desire is you.